Welcome to our first panel discussion of 2022, hosted by the International Philosophy of Nursing Society, together with the Sue and Bill Gates, the Bill Cross School of Nursing, University of California, Irvine. My name is Mary Louise Lauking, and I'm a IPONS Executive Board member and joining you from the Netherlands, Europe. So on behalf of the IPONS Board and the International Planning Committee, for this online panel discussion. We hope you enjoy the presentations and feel welcome to join the discussion after the presentations. Please feel free to use the chat function uh, for any comments that you might want uh, throughout the programme and also use the Q&A if you want to ask questions directly about the presentations. And our esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Miriam Bender and uh, Dr. Darlene Janssen will coordinate and moderate uh, those in the Q&A uh, so that we can use those um, after in the discussion. I would just like to mention three items before we introduce uh, our first esteemed colleague, Dr. Olga Petroskaya. And that is that this year in August from 17th to the 19th, we will have our 25th IPONS annual conference. And I think what's most important is our closing date for abstracts is coming up shortly on the 30th of March and more information is found on our IPONS website. Um, so our IPONS website is just ipons.online. And thirdly, just to check us out on the Twitter and we'll be using the hashtag IPONS panel. So our handle is IPONS Society in case any of you haven't uh, seen us on Twitter yet. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Olga Petroskaya, who is an assistant professor in the University of Victoria School of Nursing in British Columbia, Canada. A just assistant professor at the Faculty of Nursing, University of Alberta, Canada. Dr. Petroskaya is an active and longstanding member of the International Philosophy of Nursing Society. And in 2021, she was elected to serve as IPON's vice chair. Olga's funding program of research combines her interest in e-health and health information and communications technology. And her interest in theoretical perspectives attuned to the social maternal of healthcare practices, for example, action network theory. Currently, Olga holds a book contract with Rutledge and is working on a monogram examining how nurse scholars applied postmodernism, post-structuralism, and ideas of Michael Falkels in their writings. So. Olga, please. Thank you very much, Marie Louise, and hello, everyone. It is my great pleasure to be here and to introduce. I will be introducing our two of our panelists, and um, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Rochelle Einboden. Dr. Rochelle Einboden is a lecturer at the Susan Vehicle School of Nursing and Midwifery, University of Sydney, Australia. Dr. Ayn Boden has worked for over 20 years as a registered nurse across various practice settings with infants, children, young people, and their families, and has held teaching intensive academic roles since early in her nursing career in both Canada and Australia. After over a decade in Australia, this coming July, Dr. Ayn Boden will be returning to Canada and joining the School of Nursing at the University of Ottawa and the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario as Associate Professor and Endowed Research Chair in Nursing Care of Children, Youth and Families. In her research, Dr. Ayn Boden uses critical social theory and methods to explore health policy, programs and everyday nursing practices with an orientation towards social justice. She was awarded a PhD from the University of Sydney, Australia in 2018 for her thesis entitled Nowhere to Stand, a critical discourse analysis of nurses' responses to child neglect and abuse. Her work applies theoretical and philosophical ideas from Baruch Spinoza, Michel Foucault, Donna Haraway, and Slavoj Žižek to consider complexities of contemporary experience, situations, and relations of power. Dr. Ayn Boden's talk today is focused on nurses in the time of COVID and is entitled Super Nurse and the Use of Figuration, 
opportunities for analysis and practice oriented towards social justice. Using the example of the figuration of super nurse in COVID times, Dr. Einboden will describe how Donna Haraway's conceptualization of figuration offers a useful analytical tool to provide insights into the making of worlds and offers insights into possibilities for nursing research and practice to remake our worlds differently. Welcome, Dr. Ayn Boden. Thank you so, so much um, for that lovely introduction, Dr. Petrovska. Um, and thank you to um, the IPONS committee for the invitation to speak with you today, as well as the UCI School of Nursing for organizing um, this work. So thank you. Um, just... Can you see my screen okay? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Now we see a big shark. <laughs> you see a big shark. Oh, you see the wrong screen. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> I will get this. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Here we go. That yes. should work now. Yes, okay. you're there. Okay. Um, so before I start, I would like to acknowledge that I have the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, as an uninvited visitor and settler of the unceded territory of the, Gar the Garigal people. I'd like to acknowledge the Garigal as the caregivers of this beautiful land, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the Indigenous people of the many lands on which we meet virtually today. Um, I'd like to start with a little disclaimer, <laughs> um, mostly because I'm a bit nervous. Um, I don't consider myself a philosopher per se. I suppose it's a bit strange to open my talk in this way, um, but in addition to keeping your expectations a little bit low, I think it's important to position myself first as a practitioner, as this feels like a better fit. So I'm a nurse who enjoys engaging with the theoretical and philosophical ideas. I've always enjoyed how theory comes to life in practice, helping me to see aspects of the social or an experience that I overlooked prior to that learning. The application of philosophical ideas not only helps us make sense of the world, but also holds the opportunity to make and thus also remake our worlds. It is the remaking of worlds that I want to focus on today. In the early days of the COVID pandemic, I wrote about my discomfort with the ways nurses were being constituted as heroes and how also, and how also how readily nurses had embraced this idea. But it was Banksy that made me take pause. He gifted Game Changer, an original artwork in May, 2020 to the University Hospital of Southampton, accompanied by a note that read, thanks for all you're doing. I hope this brightens the pace up a bit, even if it's only in black and white. Goldstein in 2020 describes Game Changer as a surprisingly earnest and generous tribute to the workers of the United Kingdom's National Health Service and somewhat of an anomaly to Banksy's usual style of social critique and political commentary. The Southampton Hospital executive Paula Head reported how the staff described this painting and the implicit and the impact it had on the hospital as joyous. It has made a huge difference to the morale of the hospital at this moment and the people working here. In the early months of the international year of the nurse and midwife, Banksy gave form to a new discursive figuration of the nurse. Here she is. <laughs> While contemporary, super nurse's uniform is one of wartime nurses conjuring notions of duty and honor. She's dressed modestly, she's brave, she's with sensible shoes, and she can fly. I hope you can see in the picture here that she's protected by two masks, a theatrical mask and a surgical mask. 
She also bears the distinctive emblem of the Red Cross, a symbol of protection for wartime medical personnel since the 1864 Geneva Convention. Like other superheroes, her identity is concealed behind her masks and her cape. I find super nurse very appealing, yet at the same time, she makes me uncomfortable. My discomfort made me think more about the discursive rupture or signal. Why is super nurse so appealing? And would Banksy offer a surprisingly earnest gift devoid of social critique? I decided to take a closer look at the figuration of super nurse. To do this, I used Donna Haraway's figurations as an analytical tool. It was Claudia Castaneda's work that introduced me to Donna Haraway's ideas of figurations. Castaneda applied these ideas to identify discursive relations of power and their effects on children's bodies. Because the materiality of children's bodies is emphasized, these relations are shrouded by naturalisms and discourses of biology, making them more difficult to see and address. Materiality mixes with discourse and representation onto the actual bodies of any or all children in the process of figuration. The child is an absent or non-agential subject position and due to its material fluidity is especially malleable and thus, as Castaneda would argue, a valuable figure appropriated as a means to various social, cultural and political ends. For example, Castaneda describes how in the discourses of development, the child often appears indirectly in the more generic form of human development. The child figure embodies human development implicitly and in, this sen in, in these senses doesn't necessarily exist as a body in and for itself. And thus it presupposes the existence of a developing child body from which the adult human is made. Children are largely missing in self-representation and dominant ideologies constitute children's worth within their potentiality rather than their actuality, aligned with neoliberal understandings of human capital. In this way then, the child is overdetermined. Representations of the child are everywhere, often showing up as adult desires in accordance with our own fantasies and social anxieties, past memories, present relationships, and our hopes for the future as well as hopes for those who will save the planet from generations of adult irresponsibility. The eclipsing of actual children by the figuration of the child is a type of oppression that runs deeply into our identities, our intimate relationships, and across our relations with others. According to Donna Haraway, figurations are produced by the melding of material and semiotic elements of meaning making. In this way, then, we can see how figuration is a relation between semiotic and material, including practices and entailing universes of knowledge, practice, and power. Castaneda explains how the concept of figuration makes it possible to describe in detail the processes by which a concept or entity is given a particular form, how it is figured in ways that speak to the making of worlds. To use figuration as a descriptive tool is to unpack the domains of practice and significance that are built into each figure. A figure from this point of view is simultaneously material and semiotic effect of specific practices. Understood as figures furthermore, particular categories of existence can also be considered in terms of their uses, what they body forth in turn. Figuration is thus understood here to incorporate a double force, a constitutive effect and generative circulation. When I became interested in studying nursing responses to child neglect and abuse, I was drawn to critical discourse analysis because it offers the opportunity to produce knowledge as a resource for shaping equitable health and social practices. Unlike traditional objectivist approaches, CDA supports a research agenda that has a specific interest in and orientation towards social justice. Because CDA highlights how nurses contribute either to the maintenance or change of structures through their everyday practice, this really helps us overcome a pervasive sense of powerlessness that we often feel in, in relation to resistant or wicked social problems. Fairclough positions 
critical discourse analysis is hopeful. There's potential for social change because dominant relations of power are reinforced or resisted by everyday practices, including discursive practices. Discourse is understood in this method as a social practice, as something that we do together and as a mechanism to share, making sense of and shaping our social world. The challenge with this social constructivist approach within nursing research is that bodies are central to our work and bodies are generally understood as material. However, as I've described using the example of the child, figuration supports an understanding of bodies as hybrid, both materially and socially constructed. Further, because discourse analysis only offers a scaffolding upon which specific methodological approaches need to be built, using figuration can extend critical discourse analysis in a way that accounts for material bodies and can reconcile the contradictions that arise in their analysis. So now I'll briefly describe how I use this approach to think about supernurse. First, I reflected on her appeal. Like many nurses, I became a nurse because I wanted to make a difference. This, this desire is taken up as an unquestionable good but as a critical social scholar, I'm well aware it can get us into trouble. Nurses are sensitive to issues of marginalization and social inequity made tangible within our everyday practice. We witness the disproportionate burden of suffering, which evokes anxieties about our own health and privilege. We become open to reactive responses and rescue fantasies. While the desire to make a difference is understood as an unquestionable good, it can be caught up in anxieties regarding inequities of our own privileged positions in terms of our health or economics. Despite studying these reactions in relation to humanitarian work and writing about them in relation to child protection, as the COVID-19 pandemic started to unfold, when a friend asked me if I would go back to the front lines of healthcare, my immediate response was, of course, I'm a nurse. For myself and many of our colleagues, our profession constitutes not just what we do, but who we are. So nurses remain vulnerable to hero discourses because our work is entangled with our identities. The hero discourse is rife among political leadership across nations and replete with analogies, analogies of war and military metaphor. Popular news media and even medical leadership are producing and cementing the ideology that constitutes healthcare workers as heroes in a war between COVID-19 and humankind. A JAMA editorial entitled Healthcare Heroes of the COVID-19 Pandemic closes with a salute to the troops. While analogies of war received some critical commentary, for example, writes Anzac Day article in The Guardian, the hero discourse seems largely untouchable. Who would argue against the constitution of nurses as heroes? A closer look at what constitutes a hero is productive. In a conceptual analysis, Franco described heroism as outside rational decisions, where the action of a hero is not just altruistic, but extraordinary and somewhat irrational or risky. They argue that heroism defines actions that no one should take, but some do anyway. Further, they identify the constitution of a hero as both context and outcome dependent. The context needs to be risky enough. And if the person succeeds, they are a hero. But if the person fails, they are a fool. Next, I examine the role of super nurse in this pandemic. Politicizing and engaging the hero discourse offers an opportunity to instill a sense of duty in the face of state and social irresponsibility. In many Western and many wealthy countries with strong public health systems, such as Australia, the UK and Canada, austerity measures and healthcare reform have meant significant divestments in public services over the past four decades. Despite clear evidence of the cost effectiveness of nursing care, the state constitutes nurses as expensive and has imposed a business model on national healthcare, which means services are now run lean with limited human resources, lack of adequate space, inadequate laboratory services, limited personal protective equipment and outstanding equipment owners that have been ignored for months or even years. 
these conditions were impossible to rectify in a scramble amidst an international health crisis. In Australia, the erosion of investment in nursing education is particularly acute, and the public health system is continuously being eroded by privatization and a lack of federal investment into nursing. While we have isolated and thus lagged behind the world in our experience of COVID, we are now facing intensified calls for surge workforce. Licenses are being reinstated and students called to work prior to completion of their training. Super nurse increases social expectations for nurses to tolerate risks in their workplaces and silences nurses who consider speaking out about systemic issues and conditions of their work. She also requires that nurses shake off the traumas they witness in the course of their work, removing opportunities for them to process these experiences. What we see across Australia and likely across the world is a mass attrition to nursing. The conditions of work have created a hemorrhaging. In New South Wales specifically, fueled by a premier who reassures the public that the healthcare system is coping, nurses are taking strike action to address the refusal of government to support safe staffing ratios and insulting pay raises offers, currently 1% was offered, which is much less than inflation. I'll just share with you a, a very small snippet of this video that was published on the 15th of February this year. I think it's really hard for the community to grasp just what we're dealing with at the moment when we've got our leaders, our, our parliamentary leaders that are telling everybody that the hospital system is coping, that everything's okay. Where today, when we were standing outside Parliament House, we've heard stories of pregnant women coming into hospitals and being left in a room for eight, 10, 12 hours because there isn't a bed available for them. There's not a birthing suite available for them or patients that are having very important critical surgeries delayed because there's no ICU beds. We're having people turned away from hospital that are really sick and require hospitalisation because we don't have enough nurses to look after them. And our government continues to say that, that we're coping and nothing's happening. And I guess from nurses and midwives' perspective, we're being gaslighted in the public light. What about for you? Right. So that was, um, oops, that's really, okay. So that um, clip that I showed you was um, from February 15th. Um, when nurses defied an 11th hour order from the Industrial Relations Commission to call off a statewide strike. Um, and we've again just voted yesterday for strike action on the 31st of March. Returning to Banksy's description, depiction of super nurse, I think it's important to note the ways in which the figuration operates to entrench social inequity. The, Nursing and Midwifery Board of Australia in 2018, their data identified that 89% of nurses in Australia are women. Internationally, women make up the majority of healthcare workers, teachers, and other essential services. Super nurses female. Despite that women bear the brunt of work in managing the impact of COVID-19, decision-making is still largely in the hands of men. In Australia, Rubenstein and Bergen argue that that the decision makers have ignored the national expertise of women. Gender inequity has meant the inaction in relation to the impact of social isolation on the violence against women. Further, they argue that most state and federal budgets are gender blind. That is, they're ignorant of the very different impacts of budget measures on women that stem from the prevalence of part-time, often precarious work in low paid sectors, along with the additional burden of unpaid work in the home. And I can't help but note too, that super nurse is wearing a white theatrical mask, but her skin color looks darker. The, women, the nursing workforce in Australia is also supported by a large proportion of skilled migrants, many of whom are women of color. Is super nurse a woman of color? Possibly. Public and political responses to COVID have reproduced neoliberal rationales about what bodies matter 
Ironically, the young nurses challenged the power of super nurse figure, challenging the power of the super nurse figuration illustrate what Franco identifies as the true power and perhaps the final measure of success of a social hero. Through their acts of resistance, social heroes can ultimately guide us through the dissonance, which they themselves produced to embrace a challenging new set of values that has the potential to drive further constructive action. There is hopefulness here. The analysis of the figuration allows us a way out of its oppressive grasp. By exploring and challenging figurations, we're able to shift relations of power and remake our worlds through alternative discourses and practices. This can be done by increasing public awareness and demanding open collaborative discussions between healthcare professionals, governments, and public. And as Upshur and Nelson mentioned in 2008, describe, as, as they describe, by drawing on principles of solidarity, reciprocity, and wise stewardship. Our society and its leaders have chosen super nurse as the favorite toy of the day. I suggest that she serves as a temporary distraction for fears and anxieties that have become more acute within the context of COVID's powerful lesson. Our health is deeply connected to that of others, animals, and the earth. The already overflowing waste bin remains poised in the background. Maybe Banksy has not veered too far from his usual sharp social critique and political commentary after all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Einboden, for this thought-provoking presentation and um, an extremely timely topic. Uh, I'm looking forward to our Q&A period following all three presentations to um, further explore some questions related to your presentation. Thank you again. And um, I would like to present our second uh, panelist. Uh, Dr. Mariela Tavares Araujo. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Applied Nursing at the Nursing School of the Federal University of Minas Gerais, Brazil. Also for the last seven years, Dr. Tavares Araujo is a professor at the graduate programs in nursing and more recently in the professional master's degree in health services management at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. She is a collaborator on the Technical Committee of Nursing Workload and Staffing Requirements at the Regional Nursing Council of Minas Gerais. Dr. Tavares Araujo completed her PhD and master de master's degrees in Brazil with the focus on management in nursing and health services and held a doctoral internship at the University of Alberta, Canada. She also received a postgraduate specialization in trauma, emergency, and intensive care by Faculdade de Ciencias Medicas de Minas Gerais. Dr. Tavari Saraujo is a member of the following research and scholarly groups. The Nursing Administration Research Group, the Study Group on Health and Nursing Practices, and the International Philosophy of Nursing Society. Her research is focused on everyday nursing practice and nursing workload, elderly caregivers, and clinical and corporate governance in healthcare. Today, Dr. Tavares Araujo will be speaking about nursing practice in the intensive care unit. Uh, as far as I know, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tavares Araujo past work was informed by Davina Allen's writings on invisible nurses work, and I'm wondering if there will be relation to that body of work. And the title of Dr. Tavares Araujo's presentation today is Nursing Work in Brazil, Daily Practice and Work, measure, work Measured in Intensive Care. Welcome. Hi everyone, thank you for having me here. I hope everyone can see my presentation. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the, some reflections of nursing work in Brazil, their daily practice and uh, work measured in intensive care. 
Nursing is where everything is happening at once, where the challenges sort of wheels and requests converge. A place of resolution and articulation that works to maintain a safe patient care trajectory. An example of this comes from interviews with some intensive care units, nurses, uh, about their work pre-pandemic in 2019. Very technical, extremely technical work. There is no time left. And the day that is time left, you are already exhausted from the other days. Or you already come from a series of stressful situations that you find yourself in a scenario you became very mechanistic. So that patient demands more. But what is this demand? Many times it's just a subjective thing, E3. Basically, it is direct care, the care itself, right? A critical patient means to go from giving a bad bath to a peripheral IV. You become kind of a firefighter putting out a fire and changing the tire with the car running. These interviews passages illustrate some of the complexity behind nursing work and daily overload. An imbalance and heavy workload and its repercussions have been reinforcing the discourse of the necessity to find a reliable way to determine an optimal nursing staffing level. Because of that, much research has been developing methodologies and tools for measuring nursing workload. However, all these measurements are failing to capture the nursing work in its complexity. Then, nurses in charge and at the bedside might not recognize the way their work is represented and their load measured. Therefore, another measurement is designed as an effort to find a better methodology or tool for supporting the nursing staff in decision making process. However, all these measurements produce representation about the amount and type of nursing work that is done. This feedback cycle is encouraged by the discourse of proving how much staffing is needed to balance the visible workload in a rational way. Since the number of nursing professionals is directly related to the idea of budget. It has been observed that the more workload measurement methodologies are developed, the more the importance of professional nursing judgment is decreased. Nursing professional judgment is decreased for these tools to become more objective and reliable. The more standardized and normalized the nursing work is, the less the patient receives personalized care because there is only a single way to do and measure the care. Moreover, the organizing work beyond direct care activities, which establish relationships, connect different needs and articulate resources might be missed. As well as the relational feature of nursing work, not only with human actors, but also non-human actors, which create diverse and dynamic situations in nurses' daily work. I know this topic is familiar to nursing around the world, but I bring attention to Brazil, where nursing professional social recognition remains a struggle in society, and the assurance of adequate nursing staffing is still not recognized as an important part of the healthcare policy but relies on the shoulders of the nurses in charge. This individualization of the problem is a great weight on nurses' shoulder in health care units such as ICU. Since by the nursing professional practice law, it is the nurse's responsibility to lead the care process, working in the management of nursing care and team and establishing the relationship between the care and managing this care. Nursing work, workload and staffing requirements. Workload measures arise from understanding of what a nurse does and the nature of their work. In a contest dominated by managerial discourse, the nurse shifts from being a professional providing care 
to a professional who delivers care as a measurable package. This care is made partially visible and accountable through protocols that target budget management system. Nursing work is thus constituted by objects, units of care, verified, measured, and evaluated through a quantitative indicators. Their work becomes a product, an external indication. Sorry, external indicators are created and used by others to measure and evaluate the work's characters or quantity. Concerns about workload are a common subject of nursing research and a visible feature of daily work in an ICU setting. Globally, adequate staffing become an object of public attention during the COVID pandemic which brought attention to the paradoxical situation of the importance of nursing professionals in healthcare and the reality of precarious nursing work, working conditions worldwide. In Brazil, the number of nurses required in ICU is still controversial and mostly around the minimum of one nurse per 10 beds and one nursing technician for two beds. We have struggled with changing laws and recommendations before, during, and after the pandemic. In a close examination of an ICU workload, it is possible to understand that not only does the workload originate from the visible work, but also takes into account the load from the invisible work, named by Allen 2015 as organizing work. This is an invisible and organizational component of nursing work, which, which rely on the insurance, ensuring that all necessary elements for meeting patient needs are aligned and demands are continuously evolving, leading to an effort to close a gap between the existing organizational infrastructure and the, the ones which are needed. In Brazil, this organizing work is also invisible and non-valued by the public eyes or nursing professional themselves. The methodologies we use to measure nursing work, to measure workload rely on assumption in how they understand nursing work itself. And there is no agreement between health managers, nurse professors and researchers about the best tool or methodology to, to measure nurses' workload. The complexity in the situation increase if we consider the dynamics of power relations and the disciplinary power that might be part of this process of defining nursing work and producing efficient nursing. Despite all the knowledge accumulated around nursing workload by researchers, one of the measurement failures remains in the gathering of data surrounding nurses in their everyday practice. It is common to hear nurses complain about not having enough staff. And the answer to this matter is always the same. They need to measure their workload properly and have data to prove their workload level. And more recently, the patient risk to their managers. However, from my ongoing research, I have found that nurses don't trust or feel secure telling others what they really do for work and showing their professional practice. When reporting their workload, nurses are often, often private in their performance of care and the way they measure their workload. They often find barriers to accurate reporting and this measurement is not prioritized. The time required continues to be an issue when completing the workload measurement tools as it increased the paperwork. Similarly to the need for training about the tool or methodology. I study conclude that the volume of literature on staffing methodology is vast and growing. And despite the lack of evidence, there is an appetite for formal system and tools 
and a desire to use a tool or other formal system to support and indeed justify professional judgments. However, I have questioned where this appetite and desire is coming from, because the different ways nursing work is measured by the workload methodologies somewhat reflect nurses' work in a way they don't recognize or agree with, as it's not translate to their practice. At the same time, these workload methodologies might be shaping nurses' work in a more technical, objective way, while decreasing the subject part of this work. It's possible that nurses are concerned about how the workload reporting will reflect upon their care, as the way their care is private to the profession and can, and can come become public when reported. The failure to implement workload methodologies can be seen as a tactic, a resistance movement against this demand of public knowledge, this accountability, also a way to avoid further evaluation or increase control over their professional practice. It is a cycle. What if we restart the cycle by agreeing that nursing work, it is a care practice? This means taking into consideration a specific mode of, organization, uh, of organizing action and interaction, of understanding bodies, people, and daily lives, of dealing with knowledge and technology, technologies, of distinguishing between good and bad, and so on. Mode 2008, page seven to describe and account this for a work. And then from there, to search for what, happen, what happens in this care practice that can support ways of determining the level of nurse, nursing staff required, instead of keeping track of the workload and producing methods of quantifying it. This movement can bring the importance of nurses' professional judgment about their own practice, and, and needs back to the front stage and pull back the whole of the measurement tools and methods in defining what nurses do, what they do for work and which care the patients need. What will happen with nursing staff if nursing work is seen as a care practice? I propose an alternative. Rather than seeing nursing work as a group of care activities through the lenses of these measurements, we begin to think of it as a care practice in which the nurse professional judgment is respected as playing an important part of the process in order to translate the nursing care demand, patient, team, unit, into the number of nurses required. Practic Practice can be understood by different theories as a mixture of rituals and makeshifts, bricolage, space or places of manipulation and network operations, a product of procedures of everyday interactions uh, <clears throat> relative to structures of expectations, negotiations and improvisations or power relation, relations. Regardless of all other authors that discuss practice, I choose to bring and I choose to bring Foucault and Disserto to foreground this reflection of nursing work and workload measurements because of their understanding of practice related to discourse and power relations. According to Foucault, practice are understood as places where what is said and what is done rules imposed and reasons were given, the planet and the take for granted meet and intersect. To examine regimes of practice, it is needed to analyze rules of comportament that have both prescriptive effects regarding what is, what is to be done, effects of jurisdiction, jurisdiction and codifying effects regarding what is, what is to be done, effects of veridiction. Meanwhile, Disserto proposed that practices were constituted by the ways of operating, 
where the user reappropriates the organized space by techniques of social cultural production and rearranges it by means of multitude of tactics articulated in the, deta the details of everyday life. In practice, there is a way of thinking invested a way of acting, an art of combination with which cannot be dissociated from the art of using. Both authors were concerned with the detection of the micro relation of power in the discourse of social practice that is created and sustained in practice in everyday scenarios. In this scenario, there is no, not only scientific knowledge, but also a practice knowledge, and both act in a feedback system influenced by the discourse circulation within. Then another knowledge created has a recursive effect in which the system is feeding, limiting or changing the practice. This is one of the reasons these authors are concerned about the relation between discourse and practice and how discourse can influence practice and vice versa. Foucault and Dissertot are concerned with how things happen and if they can be reproduced in everyday life as an effect of power relation. Though Certo is more focused on everyday practice of resistance. In this way, to assume nursing work is a care practice means to assume the dimension of meaning ascribed, ascribed to it by different actors who interact in the places where the practice occur. Understanding the tensions the tensions peculiar in nursing practice imply the, the search for answers to questions that can clarify how these practices are organized in a certain context. For this, we must consider that knowledge is inseparable from practice and is also an inseparable element that constitutes rules, discourse, and doings. Nursing work is better understood as a practice rather than a discrete set of tasks. And in practice theory, the discrete, the discrete activities that comprise a practice are less important than the patterns of connection which hold a practice together. Knowledge and power come together in practice in everyday work. Uh, well, sorry, knowledge and power comes together in practice, which means in order to understand nursing practice in everyday work, it is necessary to understand their nursing knowledge behind their choices and those being constructed as care practice. These are filled with the combined objectivities and subjectivities of nursing professionals, patients and other professionals in the setting, as well as the environment. A research group led by Professor Davina Allen has been developing the track Trajectory Complexity Assessment Tool, which, which it is an evidence-based tool to support nurses' professional judgment in assessing and measuring the volume and complexity of the, the organizational components of patient care. It is based on 11, 11 factors known by their impact of, on their impact on the workload of care trajectory, assessed on patient level of complexity by nurses. These factors are health status, care needs, care team, social, psycholo psychological, social, psychological, cognitive, legal, financial resource, intervention and procedures, and transfer of care. In a collaborative work, we did a study for cultural translation and validation of this tool to Brazilian Portuguese language. And in the first phase, most of the judges who were nurses, expert nurses, experienced nurses, asked how it would work, how it would work without other validated tools to support their professional judgments about the track factors. <laughs> There is a technical discourse in which objective technical knowledge is advantageous and subjective experience, experiential knowledge is reduced. 
This movement is clear when it's observed within the development of nursing workload measurements. A nurse professional judgment about their load of work is reduced and silent to achieve the most reliable tool with less bias. These tools measure nursing work mostly objectively, while an important part of nursing work is denied for being not measurable in a quantitative way. Meanwhile, nurses do not fully incorporate the workload measurement in their everyday work as a work tool. They know that is an order in nursing practice, a standard and a prescribed setting of nursing activities, but there is also a rupture or a gray space between this routinely established practice and where other needs appear. That is, this is where organizational work is needed. Is this is in this space between the prescribed and the real everyday work. There demands that nurses do their work as a practice while documenting that could not fit in this measurement. In this space is orphanate data that create a disconnection between the number of nursing professionals and how it's impacting the nursing patient ratio, recognizing only the most visible elements of nursing practice make the work itself and the nurses more susceptible to control and managerial influences. What seems to be a simple task, measuring nurse workload in ICU in Brazil, utilizing the nursing staff methodology and validate tools like nursing activity score, NAS, it is not that simple in everyday practice. We may need to step back in the search to define how many nurses are needed based on workload measurements and instead rethink how nurses is happen happening. Theories of practice offer another way to discuss nursing work and capture the complexity of it. Further research is needed to examine nurse work measurements within this framework of understanding. Here is the reference I use in this presentation. And I would like to thank my colleagues that helped me to get all this <laughs> writing and this presentation together. Also, I'd like to thank you everyone that is here. And sorry if I speak too, too fast. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tavari Zaraujo. Uh, you did not speak too fast at all. It was perfect pacing, I would say. And um, thank you for shedding light on nurses invisible work and for offering um, ways forward with um, better appreciation of nurses' work with using uh, tools you discussed. Uh, I would like at this point to introduce Pamela Grace, a long-standing member of IPONS and um, former vice chair of IPONS. And then Pamela will introduce our third uh, panelist. So. Dr. Pamela Grace is an experienced critical care nurse and a primary care nurse practitioner and emerita professor at Boston College in the United States. Her doctorate is in philosophy with a concentration in medical ethics. Dr. Grace's scholarly endeavors include nursing ethics, moral decision making, justice in healthcare and advocacy. Thank you very much, Olga. I didn't know I was going to get, I don't have a whole lot to do in this, but thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you for the two presenters beforehand. And I'm already seeing themes that cut across um, your presentations. Um, and I would just like to say at this time, because as I was listening to people, I was my mind did go to the Ukraine and our nurse colleagues in the Ukraine and just the fact that we need to be uh, perhaps bearing witness to what they're going through at this time. So I just wanted to acknowledge that before I um, go on and introduce um, a very good colleague of mine and someone whose work I've followed for quite a while, Dr. Maria Elisa Moreno Ferguson. Um, she is um, 
well, we, we have written stuff together, but she is from Colombia. And um, her doctoral degree is in nursing science. And um, she's written extensively on those kind of topics and also has been instrumental in getting a PhD program started in her university of La Sabana University in Colombia. She has written extensively on nursing science and her background is in rehabilitation and that's actually how we ended up working together because of some qualms she had in her qualitative research. Um, she's now director of the doctoral, Doctor of Nursing Science program at La Sabana University um, and also continues her research in uh, rehabilitation nursing, which was her original practice area. Um, I just, there's so many things one could say about her, but um, I, I'll actually let her have time for her talk instead of saying more. But her presentation today is going to be on philosophical assumptions and ethical principles to cope with moral distress. So um, I would like, um, look forward to listening. Maria, I like Elisa. Can you, uh, are you there? Yes, I am here. I think the, the camera is not but working. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, for me, it's an, an honor to, to be with you. And thank you for this invitation. Uh, this is a Thanks to all the organizers and Dr. Grace for this introduction. This is a view of the University of La Sabana in Colombia, South America. As you can see, it's a beautiful and inspiring campus. All of you are very welcome to visit us. I will talk about the philosophical and ethical principles to guide clinical and research practice. My English is not so good, so I are you going to see many, many letters in the slides. The purpose of this presentation is to analyze the importance of the philosophical assumptions and ethical principles that underlie nursing discipline as valuable tools to guide practice and help nurses to have an empathetic understanding of the patient situation and bring a humanized care while given their moral distress. Uh, I am going to talk about nursing as a human science, experiencing moral distress related with research and practice and coping with a uh, moral distress. So nursing is a human science, relying on scientific and philosophical assumptions. As a human science, nursing is concerned with understanding the person as a whole being, who is identified by patterns and who has an experience that impacts the meaning they attach to the conditions they are living. Facing the existential crisis of patients and their families is a complex and frequent experience for nurses. As nurses in our different roles, we must give the best of ourselves to help the patients and their relatives to cope with the situation they are experiencing and to promote their healing and well-being. Humanization as practiced by nurses is an unconditional and responsible acceptance of the human being as a holistic being. Humanized care is characterized by nurses' interest in identifying the needs of individuals and their families in understanding the meaning of the situation they are living, in knowing their previous experiences, their culture, their beliefs and values. Therefore, humanization is the axis of nursing care. It contributes to the well-being of patients and their families and helps them cope with the difficulties they are experiencing while generating feelings of satisfaction and empowerment in nurses. Nursing practice 
is full of satisfaction, in which the nurse feels fulfilled attending the needs of her patients. They are happy moments, such as the birth of a child and the successful outcome of the treatment. But for nurses in their different roles as caregivers, as researchers, or as teachers, facing the existential crisis of their patients and their families is a complex and frequent experience in their practice. In some cases, this experience creates ethical dilemmas and causes moral distress. In my experience, as a qualitative researcher, studying phenomena such as the experience of living with a spinal cord injury, I had the opportunity to understand the impact of the disability for the participants, to understand how life changed for them and how they cope with the situation and develop new normalcy with the disability. I learned from all the participants their courage, resilience, and strategies they used to move forward with their lives. I always remember Jack and the talk we had with Dr. Pamela Grace. Jack was one of the participants who has regained their autonomy, confesses that he will commit suicide when he will be unable to perform direct activities by himself. The feeling that remains for the researcher is helplessness and the impossibility to do anything because at the moment of the interview, it was not a real situation, but it will be very possible that it will happen in the future. The feeling that remains for the researcher is helplessness and at the impossibility to do anything. At the moment of the interview, it was, no, it was not a real situation, but it will be very possible that it happened in the future. Also, during these interviews, I came to find how people in this condition at some point of in their experience, staying hospitalized, were very depressed and experienced the desire to commit suicide. When I heard these testimonies, I immediately thought, how many times in our practice this experience goes unnoticed and our efforts focus it on helping them to attend their physical needs, to prevent complication, to, to encourage them to move forward and not on their spiritual distress, trying to, combi, to be compassionate, identify this suffering and helping them to find a purpose for their life. Even in a critical care units or palliative care services, where the death of patients is frequent, the professionals consider it as a complex process and not always feel they are sufficiently prepared. Despite this, they try to construct and adapt the reality of death to their context and to create as a social cultural group, a set of strategies to cope with it. The experience with the pandemic, this was a, a terrible experience. And according to Morley et al, three issues were of great concern to nurses delivered from the care of patients by COVID the safety of nurses, patients, the health team, and families, the location of scarce resources for treatment, and the difficulty of communicating with patients and families. During the first and second peak of the pandemic in Colombia, when intensive care units and emergency services were crowded, nurses lived a traumatic, unexpected, and unpleasant experience. At that time, there was, there was not enough, enough knowledge about the disease, nor any experience related with its management. The evidence about the treatment is scarce. Nurses felt uncertainty and helplessness, living a new experience with a lack of knowledge on how to approach to the situation, learning by trial and error having in their hands the lives of the patients and the health team at risk. Some nurses didn't share their feelings and experiences with anyone, neither with their families and friends, nor with their colleagues, causing a very high emotional burden. These devastating experiences 
led the nurses to find themselves in moral distress. When nurses experience an abated moral distress from feeling helpless to act, they suffer physical and, psych and psychological consequences and become less effective as nurses. Many aspects of this pandemic have caused and are causing moral distress and unexpected challenges to the ethical values of nurses and health professionals, including complex human rights issues in many settings. The institutional culture is one factor that influences the presence, of, the presence of moral distress, especially in those entities where the medical model prevails and the voice of the nurse is not heard, and nurses' knowledge and experience are not valued. In some cases, nurses have the responsibility with no authority and have to wait for medical orders to act, watching the suffering of their patients. So coping with moral distress. A nursing philosophical underpinnings and the principles of nursing ethics are fundamental for nursing to find a, meaning, a mean, meaningful practice. A meaningful practice is based on nursing values and knowledge is relationship-centered, enable the expression of the depth of our mission. Nursing has its own vision about human beings that are characterized by holistness, complexity, and consciousness. Everyone has its own vision about his her health condition based on each one experience so nurses must establish a deep interaction with them to understand their, their needs and prescribe a nursing care to attend to. So nurses must develop an ethical competence and must know that all actions related to nursing practice have an ethical responsibility. Nurses need a solid and structural ethical education and be clear about the philosophical underpinnings of nursing discipline to cope with moral distress. Ethical competence is a complex and constantly evolving iterative process that has different components dynamical interconnected with each, with each other. Excuse me, with each other. These components are ethical knowledge as a combination of philosophical, theoretical, and practical knowledge taking into account the context uh, and people involved. Ethical sensibility or the ability imbued by compassion to recognize an ethical problem and interpret the reactions and feelings of patients and families and identify their needs. Ethical reflection as an iterative reflexive process, a way of thinking that helps to clarify our beliefs and thoughts and take into account different alternatives when analyzing ethical problems. Ethical decision-making is the process of choosing to perform a reasonable and responsible selection of action in the face of a series of alternatives. Ethical action is a specific form of act based on a deep knowledge of people, their context, and condition of vulnerability. An ethical behavior is an attitude of respect, solidarity, and compassion for others, with, which reflects the embodiment of knowledge and reflection of the ethical principles on which it is based. So there are many strategies for acquiring ethical competence. This is a, in our School of Nursing and Rehabilitation in Colombia, the students uh, we think that ethical and disciplinary education is a process that must begin during the first semester of the career. Our students learn in the first semester, start to learn about the history and nursing theory development. And they also learn about the focus of the discipline and our contribution to the health of the population. The curriculum of nursing programs for undergraduate to doctoral programs has a great strength in epistemology, in humanities, philosophy, and bioethics, 
whose continents are deepened and as the students advance in the process of learning. Some strategies that we use they are role modeling. The professor must be a model for the students. And then analysis, analysis of videos, literature, cases to case studies to deep in ethical knowledge and ethical reflection. Analy analysis of cases representing ethical dilemmas where students must participate in ethical decision making with the students from other disciplines. And also take advantage of the personal knowledge and values of the students to teach nursing ethics. So as one of my colleagues said, the main principle of the ethical competence is that you must be a good person to be a good professional. So as a conclusion, deepening nursing, nurses' knowledge in the philosophical underpinnings of the nursing discipline and about ethical dilemmas is essential to increase their self-confidence and facilitate decision-making for care. Fostering teamwork and communication among professionals ensures respect and committing to achieving common goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria Elisa Morena Ferguson. That was also um, a very good presentation and again ties together a lot of the themes in the other um, presentations. And I I think we're going to have a very good conversation. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Darlene Jansen and Dr. Miriam Bender to facilitate the question and answer session. Thank you, Pamela. And maybe um, everybody, if everybody would like to um, turn their videos back on. So we have all the panelists visible. Great. I first of all just wanted to thank everybody for the very rich presentations and dialogue and if you look at the chat box you'll see that uh, i'm not the only one that there's a lot of people that um, are very, very, very excited and interesting to hear what you have to say. Um, Darlene I, I see a question, do you want to field the first question. Sure. Um... This question came in um, after Rochelle um, was presenting. However, I'm actually going to invite um, each of the panelists to respond to it because I think that um, there's some uh, ideas that intersect. There's actually a lot of questions, so I'm not actually going to read the whole question. Miriam could maybe pick up a piece that uh, she thinks I've maybe skipped over. So um, just going to pull up my I made some notes. So the question started off, how do we stop teaching uh, to Rochelle the idea of the super nurse uh, narrative? And how do we start to interrogate the concept of self care um, appropriated by white nursing faculty from the work of black radical queer feminist theorists who conceptualize self care as radical political acts to keep oneself alive? Um, so a really big question. What um, I'm wondering if the, the two panelists, um, Marielle and Rochelle in particular, could um, talk a little bit about this idea of measuring nursing work, how the narrative of the complexity of nursing work and the idea of the super nurse are embedded in the narratives that we teach. I'd be happy to start off. With <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for the question. I see it's from Ruth and um, from Darlene. Um, I think it's a it's a great question um, because it kind of strikes at the culture of our of nursing of the nursing profession a little bit. And I can give you a very concrete example. And um, from my presentation, you know that I, I do theory from examples. <laughs> so. Um, the the stop a way to stop teaching the super nurse narrative in nursing i think is to live that with nursing students so um i i think of the work done at ubc by my colleague and by my my colleagues there um yeah. and led by kathy of lynn mcgee in responding to um the ways in which nursing students are exposed to um 
kind of horizontal violence or violence from the nurses in, in the workplace. So this idea, this old kind of adage, which I don't like to repeat because it continues it, but I think to make my point is that this idea that nurses eat their young, well, it's really unacceptable. Um, and so thinking about self-care is thinking about how we um, expect to be treated and how we treat nursing students in the context of our, of our education practices um, respectfully and valuing them as human beings and their need for self-care rather than expecting them to give, give, give. And another example that I have is in, um, in a, a current research project that um, a BN honors student is doing with me right now is looking at um, the experience of nursing students, uh, of the experience of sexual harassment for nursing students on clinical placement um, and how they're positioned in ways that make them vulnerable to sexual harassment. So I think those are kind of two practical examples about how we can resist the conceptualization of super nurse, which is essentially undermines our ability for the self-care, as you say. Thank you, Rochelle. And uh, about measurement, it is something that uh, I discuss with my students in the final year because they, they take like their last term uh, at nursing school uh, doing just their practical uh, internship in some hospital units. And most of them is concerned how to use some tools for uh, doing their practice in every day. And uh, it's like, especially in ICU mm -hmm. where we have the nursing activities for the NEST as considered international, well-known as a tool to recognize, uh, to, a tool to measure the workload. Uh, what I see it is you translate the tool, you talk with your students and nurses in service, they train everyone, but that is something missing in every day that uh, don't make this tool work in a way to show their workload, although, when we think about show our workload, we need to be careful because workload, it is our load of work. And uh, what we are calling as work and what uh, these tools are representing mm -hmm. as work, as nursing work, it is, it is uh, very easy. You just pick up like a list of tasks and say, nurses do that but the interception between one task and another and how this can make a path, a smooth path for the patient go, goes for the all needs, all their needs. It is kind of challenging every day. And um, my thought about this, it's we, we need to be careful about measurement because it's always this looping effect. We produce data, this data says something about us, we become examined and classified in a different way, and somewhat this is changing the way we, we do our work. I, I, I think <laughs> this is what I can bring about that, and uh, I hope I answer your question. Yes, Maria. Yes. I'm sorry because the camera is not working. It says that the host stopped the camera, but I don't know, maybe it's my, my computer. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, the Marielle is talking about, we are working with the School of Engineering about the, about the, to develop um, a tool to, to help nurses, to help of the nursing processes in the in the in the hospital, and as we can see, we are using many many uh, strategies, field notes, uh, and other uh, kind of measurements to trying to look at how to to establish the number of patients per, per nurse. And it's very difficult because you 
you can uh, measure the time uh, the nurse needs to, to take care of the patient, but there are a lot of interruptions. There are a lot of external factors that interfere in, in her work. So I am agree that uh, a tool to measure the workload of nurses is not, is not the best. Uh, on the other side, uh, about super nurses. Yes, we are super nurses, but the public didn't, uh, maybe they see, yes, they are super nurses, but not recognize it. We don't have the prestige, right? And uh, that we deserve with all the, the work we do. With this uh, pandemic, the pandemic shows that we have a, a lot of a suffering taking care of the patients because we were, a, a, we can't a, take care of the patients as we used to do because we feel fair to contaminate that our families, other people, we have an stigma. And in the other side, we were very afraid to, to be sick. So it was very, very difficult. And in Colombia, we don't have the recognition that we deserve. So here, when, when People talk about superheroes, talk about physicians, but not nurses. And the nurses are in front of the patient. Thank you. If, if, if I can address this, this is a topic very dear to my heart because this is what um, I study empirically. This idea of nursing is not a body count and it's not a measurement. And, and so we don't have an evidence-based model of nursing. And, uh, and, and what, what, what does everybody think that nursing is doing? So I set myself as the task of figuring out what, what is the organization of nursing practice and how can it be organized in ways that achieve what we expect with nursing quality and care. And I'll tell you the measurement, we had to, we had to create measurement and analytic tools that did not yet exist so that we could actually capture the complexity of nursing. We don't do correlation analysis. We use Boole fuzzy set Boolean math, you know, to, deter to determine conditional recipes um, of elements of, you know, context and practice and outcomes that, that work across different healthcare arenas. So it's, it's a major problem that you have all addressed and that you've done some amazing theoretical work to showcase exactly why um, old philosophical orientations don't work and they certainly don't work for nursing. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll, share, I'll share the paper of my, my study protocol, but it takes a lot of work to create methods and approaches that, that can study the complexity of nursing, but it is available to do. Um, I'm doing it and um, I, you know, I welcome everybody else joining the battle to, 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 to do the same because until we can demonstrate our unique efficacy, we, we will continue to be called heroes to make our practices effective. And we will continue to be seen as body counts by chief executive officers. And uh, yeah, it's a problem. So thank you to everybody for bringing this up and for the question. Rochelle has her hand up too. Go ahead. I just wanted to um, pick up on uh, what my colleagues were talking about as well in, in terms of the measurements and how the example that I gave to respond to this question was one of interpersonal violence. So I talked about different kinds of interpersonal violence and the workload measurements and the techniques um, of measurement are actually a structural form of violence that are done to nurses. So I kind of see that as a kind of two, two prongs to a similar kind of issue. 
and just expressions of violence are different, but definitely linked. So we only have a few minutes left. I'm wondering, does it did did any of the panelists have um, uh, anything else to address related to either the question or or the um, or the question of measurement in nursing? Before we bring it back to Catherine. I just um, I just think it's kind of paradoxical because in order to show that business isn't the business model isn't working for us, we have to have ways to show it's not working for us. But to do that, we have to use their methods, maybe, or maybe there's alternatives. I actually think um, the socio-political activity to inform the public about what we can and cannot do and what they're expecting of us is one way to go. But um, I do find this whole thing rather paradoxical about how, I mean, what we're all talking about requires some kind of breaking out of the confined spaces we're in. So while we understand that, largely well perhaps we don't understand that largely but while many of us understand that it's the bit about how we break through that's problematic that actually pam that's a great um segue to to my thoughts i i um, i'm catherine green and i'm the current chair of ipons and and so in i thinking about what you all have been saying and and it's just struck my heart to its core. Um, so I, I wanted to say that this is just an incredible gift to be able to share in real time around uh, all these different places in the world about these really difficult issues. And, um, and, and we all know that this is a terribly fraught time. That word fraught just keeps playing in my mind. And nurses are always in the middle of fraught times. We're always doing, um, it, it caught in the, in the difficulties of, um, let's see here, how did I put it? I liked how I wrote it down, that we, we have to take care of things. So we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're, we're in, the, in a world that is now haunted by war. Um, and and, and I, I doubt that anybody from Ukraine is listening in because they're too busy uh, to be able to, to even think about philosophy at this point. And, and all, I think all nurses in all situations are caught in this, in this um, business model, what somebody, a friend of mine used to call the commodification of nursing, a business model where, where um, nurses are, uh, we're doing work. And even that word bothers me. Um, when I was in graduate school in philosophy, I worked every weekend in the ICU. And so on Friday afternoon, we'd, there, there was always a, um, uh, a little party and I would go to the little party and one of my one of the advisors would always say, OK, well, Catherine, you're off to the off to the mines tomorrow. huh?" And it just felt so awful because what the person was saying to me was I was just off to do work. Not necessarily to think or to or to care or to love. And so um, I think that that what you're talking about now, what we've been talking about in this conversation is how we break away from it, as Pam said. Well, the problem, and Rochelle put this perfectly when she began, um, because she says, I'm not a philosopher. Well, Aristotle would be a prodding because, because philosophy begins in reality. It starts with reality. And so what we're doing, what you all are doing, I'm just watching it, are, are looking at the reality uh, that nurses are involved in around the world today and trying to think about how to understand that reality first 
and then to begin to respond to it. And the problem that we're caught in right now, I think particularly, is that that kind of thinking requires time and it requires a little bit of distance. And if we're always caught in the middle of these difficult situations, pandemics, wars, and, um, and political situations that are beyond our control, it's very hard to um, stop and think about what we're doing. It reminds me of a joke. If you're up to your elbows in alligators, it's very hard to remember that the original goal was to drain the swamp. So our problem then as nurse philosophers is to try to figure out how we, you largely, because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm moving on as, to, as time's going on, but, but you who are in the thick of things have to figure out how to get the time you need to think carefully about what you're doing. And so I can't thank you enough for coming. For all of those of you who have joined us, in this conversation. We are delighted that you are here. And I think a special thanks to um, uh, Marie Louise um, and those of you who are in that part of the world where it is time to go to bed, it's past time to go to bed. So um, a special thanks to you for coming, uh, for joining us. And, and I guess I would end with a, a, a deeply felt wish do take good care of yourselves. We appreciate you so much. Thank you. Miriam, your turn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming to this um, really fantastic event. Thank you for everybody who um, shared a question, who shared their thoughts in the chat. Thank you to the panelists. Um, we will send um, the, um, excuse, uh, the link to a recording of this next week. Um, the 25th, um, the 25th um, International Nursing Philosophy Conference is being held here at Irvine, um, August 17th through 19th. I am just now going to share with you the um, URL link. Um, please take a look, submit an abstract, um, come to the conference, it's hybrid, virtual, or in, uh, in person. And um, thank you everybody for um, attending. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you all. You did a great job. I am just so impressed. Thank you so much. Thank you.